All right, Rocky, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. I, I see in the message board, there's folks from New Jersey, New Hampshire, Virginia. I'm originally from Florida and I live in Pennsylvania now. Um, so it's so good to be with everyone here tonight. I'm grateful I have the opportunity to share my experience, strength and hope with all of you um, who have loved ones who are struggling with addictions. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the positive role that Karen played in my family. My wife, Jen, went through Karen's intensive outpatient program in the early days of her recovery. IOP provided her the foundation to maintain her sobriety for the last 13 years and counting. And the role Karen played in my wife's life has been transformative. So thank you. My talk tonight is about powerlessness and how working in Al-Anon program has given me the serenity by admitting my own powerlessness. I work a 12-step program through Al-Anon, and my home group is only Al-Anon spoken here. We meet Thursday nights at 6 p.m. at West Lawn United Methodist Church, not far from Karen. Uh, invite any of you who would like to attend. Usually there, we like to welcome newcomers. I serve as our group's treasurer, and I have a sponsor. I was first encouraged to attend Al-Anon by my therapist. Her reasoning for my attendance was twofold. One, my fiance Jen was in AA, and by attending Al-Anon, I'd be able to speak the same language as her. And most importantly, two, my controlling behavior was taking our relationship down a wide road, traveled frequently when one person tries to control someone else, a strained relationship or breakup. In August 2021, the month before I entered the rooms, I proposed to Jen. I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. I also wanted to control her actions, how she spent her free time, and how she felt and acted. Even though Jen had 11 years of sobriety under her belt, I felt like I could do a better job of managing her life than she did. There were many things that I tried to control in her life, but one of the worst areas that I just couldn't seem to let go of was her TV watching. As the son of an ex-Amish father who was raised in a highly controlled media environment, watching too much television had moral implications. Growing up, there was only one TV in our house. We watched less than 20 hours of TV a week, and all of those hours were after sunset and never during mealtime. The reason for this was that television was a fantasy land, an escape from work, and should be strictly limited. Free time was to be spent doing something productive. My behavior surrounding Jen's TV watching was crazy making. When she would watch TV in the mornings on the weekend, I passively aggressively mumbled under my breath that we could be using this time to start our Saturday morning chores. When my attempts at manipulation didn't work and she kept watching TV, I gave her the cold shoulder and ignored her. And so I started my day frustrated because I was forced to wait to get my day started until she was done watching television. I was obsessed with her behavior, trying to control what she did with her free time. And she wasn't the only one. A family member was late for a holiday and I almost ruined the holiday because of my anger. I gave the cold shoulder to another family member for months because they weren't acting the way I wanted them to act. If someone did or said something I didn't like, I excommunicated them from my life by ghosting them. I'm not proud of this. All of these things I did in the hopes that I could change their behavior, but no matter what I did, I was powerless to change their behavior. Most recently, I've had a big struggle with my ninth step, which is making amends to others for my past behavior. I dug my heels in the ground and said to my sponsor, to folks in the rooms, I won't do this. This is the dumbest step I've ever heard of. Why am I even going back to dig up old graves and deal with what happened in the past? The past is past. I don't want to look at it. I won't look at it. And I'm not making amends to others. The thing's this. I didn't want to met, admit that I was wrong. <laughs> my, my ego was pretty big. I didn't want to admit I had a mis made a mistake. I didn't want to admit that I wasn't perfect. I shared this at a meeting, and afterwards a lady came up to me and said that as long as I say, I won't, I won't, then your higher power will stay on the sidelines and wait. 
But when you get to the point you cry out and you say, I, I can't, I can't, then your higher power rushes to your side to help you get through it. This is the paradox of powerlessness. By admitting that I was powerless and needed help, I became empowered and received the help I needed. Here's an analogy that my wife shared with me that illuminates this point. I want everyone to close their eyes. Close your eyes. Imagine that you're a lamp. As a lamp, what's your primary purpose? To light up the room. And so you try with all your might to light up that room. You push as hard as you can, but nothing happens. No matter how hard you try, your light won't turn on. Nothing changes and the room remains dark. But then something happens. A flip switches. You feel a surge of energy coursing through you. It's a strong and powerful force. Something has changed. This time's different. This is your moment. You try yet again to turn on your light and voila, let there be light. Open your eyes. The once darkened room is bright and full of light. You have illuminated the room with your radiance. This is what happens when you connect with a higher power. And as you open up more and more to your higher power, the brighter you become and the further you can see. You couldn't do this on your own. It was by connecting to a higher power that you were able to connect to your true purpose. Working in Al-Anon program is all about this paradox of powerlessness. By admitting my powerlessness over alcohol, other people, and even my own behaviors, I'm able to experience a freedom and lightness that I've never known before in my life. In particular, I want to share four Al-Anon practices that empower me. The first practice that empowers me is doing service work. Within two weeks of attending Al-Anon, I was asked to serve as my group's treasurer. I agreed, and I quickly built a resentment to this service position because I was responsible for collecting the weekly donations from the basket for group expenses. If I wasn't there, then money piled up in the basket. And then people would see that I was irresponsible. And I just couldn't have that. But this service position was the best thing for me. It kept me coming back every week. It held me accountable. Service work, such as serving as treasurer, chairing meetings, sharing my story, or putting away chairs at the end of a meeting <laughs> has taught me many things how to reach out and ask for help, how to work together, and that my presence is valued and is part of the group's well-being. Service work showed me that I mattered. The second is attending meetings. When I first stepped into the rooms, that thing that made me the most uncomfortable was this unvarnished sharing of emotions and feelings. So much talk about feelings, smoldering anger, whispered fears, weeping sadness, overwhelming anxiety, slithering jealousies, pirouetting joy, newly born courage, unfolding its wings. Folks shared what they were feeling without hesitation, without needing to think about what they were feeling, without needing to journal about it. They just spoke their truth with clarity and freedom. From them, I'm learning to share my feelings with others. Instead of bottling it up and trying to control my feelings like I did for most of my life, I learned to open up to others. I felt safe in my home group to share with others what I was feeling. I learned from them that no matter how intense my feelings may be, they're only feelings. Emotions are reactions to reality and facts are feelings. In the rooms, I hear how other people work their program and I learn from them. As I shared earlier, I'm currently stuck on my ninth step. At a meeting, someone shared that it took them eight years to make an amends with someone in their life. Eight years. By listening to this person share, I felt a weight drop off my shoulders. I don't have to make amends to everyone immediately. This is my program, and there are no musts in Al-Anon. My sponsor frequently tells me that meeting makers make it, meaning that those who habitually attend meetings are able to sustain their program. 
And this is why you'll find me at the West Lawn United Methodist Church on Thursday nights at 6. I've made a promise to myself to attend at least one in-person meeting a week. So if I do have to miss my home group, I go to one on Saturday morning. And if I'm out of town for a long weekend, I attend online meetings. Meeting makers make it. The third practice that empowers me is working with an Al-Anon sponsor. As I shared, I'm very good at bottling things up and suppressing my feelings, not sharing them with others. With my sponsor, I learned to flex that muscle of reaching out and connecting with others. When I'm stuck or feeling powerless or overwhelmed in a situation, I can call him, pick up the phone, and I can say, hey, I need to talk. I'm stuck. I experienced a lot of growth by working the fourth step with my sponsor, which is making a fearless and searching moral inventory of myself. When I worked my fourth step, I unburdened myself with character defects that I'd carried with me for many years and that had filled me with shame. I also uncovered character assets, and he showed me the positives I bring into the world. Two sides of the coin. Recovery work is difficult, but it's empowering. The fourth practice that empowers me is reading the Al-Anon literature. In Al-Anon, we don't have a big book like they do in AA, but the closest thing we have is how Al-Anon works for families and friends of alcoholics. I My screen, there it is. Yeah, how Al-Anon works for families and friends of alcoholics. I'd encourage you to pick it up. That's my shameless plug. Um, one of the best readings on the subject of powerlessness comes from the section on step one, and I want to share that with you tonight. Whether or not we live with active drinking, life is unmanageable whenever we lose perspective about what is and is not our responsibility. With this first step, we admit that we did not cause, cannot control, and cannot cure the alcoholic, the disease of alcoholism, or the fact that we've been affected by this disease. We are powerless over alcohol and its effects on us. By ourselves, we can do nothing to overcome the effects of this disease. In fact, our attempts to exert power over alcohol have made our lives unmanageable. So we take the first step. We admit we are powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable. Al-Anon doesn't promise that every alcoholic will get sober or that sobriety will solve our problems or fix our relationships. We may never have the family of our dreams or win the love of those who have no life to give. But our program does offer us hope because it's all about change. By being honest and admitting that the power we tried to wield over alcoholism was never readily available to us, we let go of the illusion that kept us imprisoned in the endless cycle of repetitious, self-defeating behavior and inevitable disappointment. When we let go of this illusion, we move in a more positive, productive, and rewarding direction. We move towards hope. I read Al-Anon literature every day. Al-Anon has several different daily readers, and I keep my daily reader, Courage to Change, in a place well-suited for brief reading. The bathroom, a nightstand, or in your car are also good choices uh, to read daily literature. I'm also a big fan of the slogans, and I repeat many of them over and over when I'm struggling with something. I have three slogans on my mirror that I look at every day. Easy does it, one day at a time, and let go and let God. The literature changed my perspective, and I began incorporating the lessons I learned from the readings into my life. A month after I started attending Al-Anon, I wrote this in my journal in, in regards to my attempts to control Jen with her TV watching. Let it begin with me. I don't, have, I don't have to watch TV with Jen. I can go off and do my own thing. I can say no. I can stop watching TV when I want to. I can go do something else. I can make suggestions and say things to her. But the, at the end of the day, it's her life, not mine. I can't control how Jen thinks and feels. 
let it begin with me. By putting the principles of Al-Anon into action, my life has changed for the better. I want to end my story with a final gift to all of you here tonight. And that is the peace prayer that is found in Al-Anon's blue book and is known in AA circles as the step 11 prayer. This prayer is an admittance of our own powerlessness and a request to our higher power to give us the strength and resources we need. I hope to practice the principles of this prayer in all my affairs. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me bring love. Where there's offense, let me bring pardon. Where there's discord, let me bring union. Where there's error, let me bring truth. Where there's doubt, let me bring faith. Where there's despair, let me bring hope. Where there's darkness, let me bring your light. Where there's sadness, let me bring joy. O oh Lord, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that one receives, it is in self-forgetting that one finds, it is in forgiving that one is forgiven, it is in dying that one awakens to eternal life. Thank you everyone um, for taking the time to listen to my share. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over uh, to Rocky and Christine. Thank you, everyone.